Hello, welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist, Ben Gallagher. This is the first one on the series on genetic engineering. And this one follows on very closely from the evolution videos where we studied natural selection. Because now that you understand how the theory works in nature, we need to look at how we've manipulated it artificially to create new organisms for our own purposes. This is from the GCSE specification, and please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you. Let's do a very quick review on some of the key evolution points that feed into this. And let's look again at adaptations and let's focus on canines. Canines are dogs. So if I pull up here a timber wolf, timber wolf, think about its abiotic environment. It lives in places that are very, very cold. You can see this one's dusted in snow. So they've got very, very thick fur to insulate them. They've got really good hearing to hear any prey animals uh, that they might want to go and attack. They've got two eyes forward facing, as almost all predators do, to give them depth perception so they can really zone in and hunt and grab at something in front of them. And look at the teeth, really sharp teeth for hunting and killing. It's a really well adapted killing machine there. Something more familiar, European fox. We've all seen these in the UK, but not dissimilar to the wolf. Really good hearing, fur to keep themselves warm. They can shed their fur to change their coat summer to winter to adapt to the seasons. Um, teeth, forward facing eyes, good vision again. In Australia, we've got a dingo. Coloration allows it to be well camouflaged in the Australian outback. Um, really good hearing, look at his ears, long legs to run long distances. Again, really well adapted to its own environment, an African wild dog here, similar adaptations, but again, perfectly adapted to its own environment. A hyena here in Africa, massive muscular neck to allow it to tear and rip at flesh, um, huge powerful jaw to break bones and get the bone marrow out because hyenas, they do hunt, they do kill, they do work in packs, but they're also scavengers. And if they find bones that have been abandoned by lions, they'll grind the bones up with their teeth to get the nutrition out of the bone marrow that might be held within them. Again, brilliantly adapted canines, all of these, they're all perfectly evolved and adapted to their own selective pressures but none would be suitable as a family pet. There's not one of those creatures that I would let into my house or anywhere near my children. Even a fox, quite small, that I saw a video quite recently. It was a fox in a park and two idiots were going up to the fox, trying to pet it, going, oh, lovely fox, oh, it's like a dog. And of course the fox just felt threatened, bit one of them, attacked one of them, because it's a wild animal, they're aggressive. You would not want one of these guys in your home. So all of those previous ones were wild species. Let's look at some more canines now that exist, but that don't exist as wild creatures. These are canines that have been created by us. So over here, we've got a Jack Russell. Jack Russells don't exist in the wild. They have been bred to be very small, aggressive, sharp teeth, because we used to use them for hunting rabbits. Very small, they can go down rabbit holes, catch the rabbit, drag it out. They're hunting dogs, okay? Really useful for us, when one of the selective pressures is always about getting food, we've effectively bred a creature that can get more food for us to improve our survival chances. Another example here, we've got a collie, okay? Beautiful dogs bred for their intelligence because actually at some point in history we went, it would be really useful to have a creature that was clever enough to follow instructions we give it, to be able to understand things uh, we tell it, to learn certain patterns um, that we can use it as a kind of little servant to do our bidding, and it's clever enough to do that. That's why we bred these dogs again, so we can use them to herd sheep or use them to do various things for us, for our benefit. Another one here, a bloodhound. Bloodhound, enormous nose, really, really good at smelling things out, smelling food out for us smelling out, you know, they were used by the police force a long time ago, but to smell out evidence, to smell out clues, to track down criminals, really useful for us. Again, another one, this is a beautiful, beautiful dog, one of my favorite dogs, Burmese mountain dog, huge, powerful dog, bred to be very loyal, very, very protective. It rescues people that get lost in the freezing mountains. Huge paws to walk on the snow and to help swimming because they're massive surface, massive thick neck. It can actually use its neck to break through the ice as it's swimming through frozen lakes that someone might have fallen in. Huge, powerful jaws to grab onto someone, but quite soft mouth so they don't hurt them as they're dragging them to safety. Big enough and strong enough to do that. 
beautiful, beautiful dogs. Again, rescuing us for improving our survival chances. Talking of big dogs, this guy. Um, Google biggest dog in the world and you'll find some brilliant photos of these. They are absolutely massive. This is a South African Burble. Huge dogs, bred to be huge, bred to be very aggressive because they were bred to fight off lions. Way back when we were farming cattle and whatever um, in South Africa, where these ones came from, they were bred to make the biggest, fiercest dogs possible to protect our food, the cattle, the sheep or whatever we were farming, that lions would come and attack. We bred these massive dogs to fight off and scare off the lions for our benefit. It's not a great benefit for the dog, send them out to fight a lion. Survival chances are relatively low, but really good for us if we could scare the lions off, keep our food in reserve. Um, now, all of these you can see really useful purpose for our benefit. I'm going to put two others up here now. Have a look at those. I'm sure they've popped up on the screen and lots of you have gone, ah, but have a look at them. Think about their purpose. They don't exist in the wild, remember, and if they were released into the wild, their survival chances would be slim. But have a look at them. Why do they exist? Why did we create and breed these? They're ornamental. We bred these because we liked the look of them. We wanted cute little dogs that we could have. You could argue there is a very good reason for them in terms of companionship. That if you've got someone who's lonely, dogs are amazing companions. They're really, really loving. And if you can't handle a big dog, you can't look after a big dog. It's great to have a small dog for companionship. But even so, their purpose from a survival point of view from, uh, uh, for us is minimal. And actually, potentially to the massive detriment of the animal. If you look at the pug next to me here, look how his face has been bred to be all pushed in because that's the look that we want. But actually pugs have massive problems with breathing because their nose has been so pushed in, then airways around there aren't very good. A lot of them end up having to have operations on their nose and faces to allow them to breathe because they've been bred so small um, and it's over quite a rapid amount of time without thousands of years of evolution to make little changes, correct and adapt for that change and so on. Because they've been bred quickly and pushed through, things haven't had time to readapt to each other. So actually a pug's brain is quite forced inside. It's a very small head. It's why the eyes have had to be pushed way forward to make room for that, why they've got their eyes that push out. You know, is, is this good for the animal? It's up to you to decide that. What I'm saying here is that none of these exist in the wild. We created them and we created them for our own reasons, not for the animals reasons, but for our own reasons. In other words, they've been genetically engineered by us. And this is a very simple, very primitive, very old form of genetic engineering where we've controlled the breeding, we've controlled the genetics to get what we want. So this is the most important slide in this. This is looking at the actual mechanism of artificial selection. Now, if we compare artificial selection by selective breeding, which I mentioned a minute ago, let's compare it to natural selection first, because in evolution, the per process is called natural selection. We're talking about artificial selection. But in natural selection, it's an organism's adaptations to its selective pressures that determine its survival and hence its breeding chances. And if it's got good adaptations, it can breed. The numbers of that mutant type though, with those adaptations will increase. And that's what tends to populate. Now, that's a natural process and it ensures survival of the fittest. Fittest being the best adapted, the best survivors. Now you need to think that in artificial selections, we're in charge. Humans decide who lives and who dies. Humans decide which animals can breed, not the environment and not the selective pressures. So we control the organism's survival and breeding chances because the organism itself, whatever the creature is, let's say it's dogs still, the dog doesn't need to worry about survival because we're looking after it. We're keeping it safe in its abiotic environment. We're keeping it warm or whatever. We're giving it food. We're protecting it from predators. So it doesn't need to worry about all the things that animals uh, that are a pressure on animal survival in the wild. So the only thing affecting whether that animal can survive and breed and pass on those genes are us. We are deciding for that animals, for those animals, which ones get to breed and which ones don't. That might sound barbaric, but it's something we've been doing for thousands of years. 
So this is the mechanism, this is the flowchart. So human decides what characteristic they want, whatever it may be, we might be trying to get a big dog, big creature. We might be trying to get one that produces more meat if we're gonna eat it. We might want one that's faster. We might want one that's more intelligent. We might want one with a different kind of fur. We might, of course, originally, given that we did selective breeding on wolves, we wanna get rid of the aggressive characteristic. So whatever the characteristic is, we choose it. We then select individuals that show signs of that trait. So let's say it's getting rid of the, or trying to minimize the aggression that you would see in wolves. We pick the least aggressive wolf we can find, and we allow that one to breed. Then we look at the offspring, and we pick which of the offspring show that trait most strongly. So of the offspring of the least aggressive wolf, which are the least aggressive of the offspring? The others, we don't allow them to breed, okay? We pick the least aggressive one, and when it's old enough to, we breed from that one. So we're breeding from the least aggressive of the least aggressive. Then of its offspring, we only allow those to breed. And then we pick the offspring which shows the trait most strongly and we only allow that one to breed. And each generation, we keep picking the least aggressive of the least aggressive of the least aggressive and so on, until eventually, if you just repeat for as many generations as it takes, you can concentrate that characteristic, that non-aggressive characteristic, you can concentrate by taking the least aggressive of the least aggressive of the least aggressive, or the biggest of the biggest of the biggest, or the whatever, fastest of the fastest of the fastest, until after enough generations, you get an animal that shows the trait that you want by artificially selecting which ones can breed. You select the breeding artificially. It's artificial selection of breeding. Okay, select breeding by artificial selection. What we're talking about really is that we pick what we want. We're in control of the animal's survival and its breeding chances because we control its environment. Uh, take a screenshot of this one because this is the key process. Okay, let's look at a few examples of how we as humans have done this then. What we're going to do, we're going to pick the wild one and we're going to see how it turned into a domesticated or sort of bred version. Domestic version means the one that we have made domestic and the one that works for us. So if we start off here with an auric, massive wild K, okay, it doesn't exist anymore, it went extinct. Look at it, huge noble beast, massive horns for fighting off any predators or for making itself more attractive to the opposite sex, to the, the lady aurochs. Huge, great, powerful beasts were good to eat. And at some point this would have been noticed. It would also have been noticed that the female aurochs fed their young milk. And it would have been realized at some point by early humans that milk is good to eat for us nutritionally. It's something useful, it's another food source. So over thousands of years, we took aurochs, took female aurochs, took the ones that produced lots of milk, bred those of their offspring, the ones that produce the mo most milk, we kept those, bred them, until we got cows that produce way more milk than they should naturally. These are the dairy cows that we're very familiar with. But of course, we don't just get dairy from cows, we also get meat from them. So again, from oryx or wild cows, we bred the ones that had the most muscle, that were the biggest, most muscular ones, because meat that we eat is muscle. If you can get a cow that naturally produces huge amounts of muscle, it's producing more meat. So we selectively bred from wild cows and oryx, dairy cows that we see today, and beef cattle that we eat. Jumping outside of animals now, let's look at these strawberries. Those ones over on the far side, those are wild strawberries. You can still find wild strawberries growing in various places. And back when we were foragers and hunter gatherers, we'd eat wild strawberries and we'd find them. But at some point, someone said, oh, this wild strawberry makes slightly bigger strawberries than the other ones. Let's dig it up. Let's plant it where we want it. Let's pollinate from that one and hope to get plants that give only the bigger strawberries. And then when you have those, some of those after you've got many, many plants, would give bigger ones than the rest of the bigger ones. So you'd breed from that ones to get one's more like the ones we see today, the commercial strawberries that you can buy in shops, but they don't exist in the wild. The strawberries that you're so used to, they were artificially selected by us and created. What about these? Do you know what those are? Those are carrots. Those are primitive, early, wild carrots. You can still buy them, you can still grow them. 
but they're very small. They don't have a lot of starch in them relative to modern carrots. They're a different color, but the color is kind of irrelevant. We didn't really artificially select and breed carrots to be orange. That's more of a byproduct. But we made them to be much, much bigger. That bit that comes down underground, that's the tap root. That's the root of the plants. Roots should spread out to get loads of nutrients. But we selected the ones at the biggest, thickest tap root because it's the root that we eat. Because plants store huge amounts of their glucose, our starch, in their roots. So if we can grow them and get as much starch as possible into the roots, really good food resource for us. Last one. You've probably seen this if you've been on holiday and haven't mown your lawns for a while. The lawn goes to seed and it sends up little runners and you get little things like this, the little seeds. All grasses form things like this. That's how they seed. Now, over many, many thousands of years, we picked grasses and crossbred them and looked for grasses that gave really big seed pods like these. This is corn. Corn that we make flour, that we make bread, that we use in so much of our foods. But corn is still a type of grass that makes these similar grass seeds. But the seeds are now huge, full of starch, which is what the seed would use early on in its growth when it's first um, becoming a seedling. We've effectively artificially selected grass into an amazing food crop that we plant in billions of numbers in fields that grows to make us loads and loads of corn. OK, so corn is still doesn't exist naturally. We've created it. So we've been domesticating plants and animals for over 10,000 years. It's about 10,000 years ago that we first started capturing cattle and trying to keep them in one location and then starting to breed from them. It's about 10,000 years that we've been cultivating grasses to make corns, planting them in one location rather than foraging for them. It's what allowed us to settle in single places and start building civilizations. But it's not a new process. Genetic engineer engineering to our own wants and needs is not a new invention. The technologies have massively advanced over time but the concept is not new. So move on from here then to genetic engineering two, where we start to look at the new modern methods for genetic engineering. This video focuses on cloning and genetic modification, which is a much, much more modern and technical way of getting an organism that you want immediately without having to wait through generations and generations of artificial selection. So head to that one next. Please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so yet. Like this video if you find it useful and head over to my Facebook channel for some extra bits of biology. Thank you.